Are you a sex worker looking to build a new website or a website redesign? Then you'll want to consider Fox Digital. They did a fantastic job designing my website, Stripped by Sia. If you want your website done, mention that you're a listener of the show at foxdigital.design for 20% off. Tell them I sent you. Hey everyone, just popping in here. Um, I'm just putting out a bit of a trigger warning. Um, During this episode, we speak briefly uh, to open up the conversation about artificial intelligence um, with just recently passed creator Coconut Kitty. She just passed away about a week after uh, that we recorded this. We were thinking about taking it out, um, but for context, it didn't really work with the editing process. So just want to put a bit of a trigger warning. Um, Coconut Kitty is briefly spoken about here in this episode, and may she rest in peace. Thanks very much. everyone welcome back to another episode of stripped by sia your podcast for sex workers strippers and all the fancy naked people in between my name is steph sia i am a fellow dancer i am also a digital content creator i've been doing this show for the past i guess going into the fourth year which is kind of exciting and also really mind-boggling to me that you all are still listening um together with me so thank you so much um um, other than that, I, I guess I can now say that I'm a cam model, since I'm doing that on a pretty regular basis. You can find me on Streamate under Sia, uh, Sia on camera, that's me. And yeah, I am uh, doing this show because I think it's really important for us to tell the real stories of sex workers and our industry. So every single week I bring on a different guest and that person might be a talent. So someone in front of the camera, they might be an independent um, creator um, like myself, or we even have people that are behind the scenes, um, producers. We also have like nonprofit organizations, professors, allies, and people that are sex work adjacent. Um, All this to really paint a really transparent and robust picture of our industry because oftentimes um, society and mainstream media will um, make their own assumptions about what it is that we do, often based on negative stereotypes. So I feel it's really important to tell real stories, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, just so we can help better understand the work it is that we do. And for you, the listener, because actually there's a lot of these that are not even in this community <laughs> at all, that you guys are uh, quote unquote vanilla people. Um, I think it's a really great tool to, to educate yourselves on that. So um, A plus for you for listening in and broadening your mind. Um, <laughs> just a couple of things before we get started and before I, I bring on our lovely guest, which I am super excited Four, if you want to skip over this boring stuff, just skip into the four to five minute mark is when I usually am done my spiel. But I just want to say a quick hello to all the Patreon subscribers. Um, hello and welcome. Um, we have a lot of you great subscribers that are helping financially support the show, mainly my website, strippedbysia.com. And um, some of you get a wonderful fan recognition shout out on the show for being on the second and top tier of the Patreon subscription. So uh, I just want to say a quick hello to some people out here. We've got Trey Lonti, we've got Marty Lang, we've got Ted McGuire, um, we've got some um, great people here in my own backyard, uh, Arup Skarkar and Jay Sunsern. We also got folks from Germany. We've got uh, Snoo Snoo out here. We also got our fellow Americans, uh, Justin Erickson, also um, loyal fans of the show since day one. So thank you so much for all of your support. Um, If you're wondering what kind of value um, is included in a subscription, you can check it out. It's patreon.com slash stripped by Sia. Um, just to name a couple examples here, fan recognition shout outs. It's one thing. Uh, you get exclusive video content that is not found anywhere else. It's all just private up on there um, that you can get to see um, some of the f- hilarious content <laughs> that we film behind the scenes. And also uh, just to kind of get um, like a visual uh from the people that I bring onto the show that, and also some great bonus episodes, which I will be putting up 
very, very soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, feel free to check it out. It's uh, for as low as $4 a month. You can kind of pick and choose. And yeah, be sure to check it out. Patreon.com slash Stripped by Sia. Um, also, if you enjoy podcasts like this and you're interested in the adult industry, maybe different parts of the industry as well, I am part of Skyhawk After Dark TV. It is a adult industry network um, that has podcasts such as mine. We also have video casts as well. So if you're interested in more video based content, you can go check it out there. Lots of really great interviews and people that I've brought onto the show myself. They've got their own shows and their own things going on as well. So please go and support. It's skyhawkafterdarktv.com. And last but not least, I mentioned my website, strippedbycia.com, uh, was made by the lovely friend of mine, Anthony from Fox Digital. Um, he makes some really great websites, which are available at a low cost. And for all Stripped by Sia listeners, he is giving 20% off um, on certain packages. So feel free to reach out to him. It's Anthony, and he can be found at foxdigital.design. Four minutes, 55 seconds. Here we go. Okay, so... <laughs> I am super excited to bring on this week's guest. Um, I would I would like to say that you were a friend of mine <laughs> in the industry, yes. definitely. And I have been wanting to bring you onto the show for so long, but there's just so many topics that you'd be so good at. And I'm just like, finally, this topic came up and I just know how nerdy you are about it and how passionate you are about it. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce the audience to fellow digital content creator, founder of Sexwork CEO, co-host of the On the Horizon podcast, fellow YouTuber, gamer, uh, creator of Networthy, all-around workaholic crazy person, um, probably why I like you, Melrose Michaels. <laughs> that was the most accurate introduction anyone's ever given me. That was really impressive. You did a fine job. I've got nothing to add. That was great. <laughs> I mean, like, okay, first of all, I really admire you. I I, um, I don't know anyone else that works, like, so hard. And so like hard. you? No, like you, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really amazing. And you do so much for the industry. I love Sexbird Studio. There's so many great tips. And it's such a great resource. And, yeah, I'm just I'm, – I'm amazed. You're so talented. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. No, um, I think I relate to you on that because even when I interviewed you for On the Horizon, that was a, the standout for me was like, you do so many things and you manage to get it all done. And that resonates with me because even though we feel like we're like moving the needle, it still at the same time feels like we're failing all around because there's just so many balls in the air, pun intended. Um, <laughs> so it's just like, it can be really overwhelming. So I, I hate that. Um, so I know a lot of creators look up to me in that way, like I've got it all managed, but the reality is it is a shit show that things go wrong all the time and it, I'm not perfectly consistent the way I'd like to be everywhere. And that's kind of just the name of the game. I just, I fail occasionally. And the the thing that keeps me going is that I just keep going and it, it looks very, you know, cohesive on the outside, but on the back end, it's just all chaos. <laughs> I hear you completely. It's just like, yeah, we were doing all the things, but you should like see me in the stress case that I am and how like chaotic things are like <laughs> this insanity. But, but yeah, I mean, like you do all the things, um, you have all the titles. Um, was there anything that you wanted to add? Because usually I throw it back to our guests so they can define who they are in their own words. And terms. <laughs> I mean, you did such a fine job. I think that kind of, Aside from the businesses, right? Aside from so networking, clothing is a clothing company. Um, Sexwork CEO is an educational resource that's free for creators. Um, and I've, obviously, I'm an adult creator myself, so I can speak to these things because I use myself as a case study for everything I put out that's educational. So I have data um, to support the suggestions I'm making. I think that's really important. And I really have this belief that there was way too much gatekeeping in this industry, especially when I was first getting in. Like I could not get someone to help me to save my life. Um, and because of that, it took me 10 years to get to where I am in my career. Well, 11, if you're really counting, but who's counting? Um, so <laughs> being this far along, it's just like, if I could have had the information I have now, I could have drug that like future to myself, you know, at the five year mark or at the three year mark. So if I can mm -hmm. help more creators be more educated in terms of sales and marketing and all that goes into that, 
um, more quickly, I feel like I can curve their learning so that as an industry of independent creators, we have more financial resources to do things like lobby for policy or change and impact our space with organization and organizations. So those are kind of my beliefs and that's what keeps me going. Um, and obviously it's not all, you know, buttery smooth and beautiful on the inside, but just the, the feedback I get from the community where they're like, I tried that thing and it made all the difference in my business. Like that is so fucking worth it to me. That makes me like, it could bring me to tears, honestly, like that's what I live for. So anything I do, I, uh, I really try to be in service. Like that's the whole point for me. That's so great. And you said something really interesting there in terms of like, being so sick of the gatekeeping, um, I completely understand and resonate with that because like you, when I started sex work 10 years ago, again, during a time where I didn't even consider what I was doing as sex, as sex work, I used to be a sugar baby a yeah. long time ago. There wasn't like, I mean, there was some camaraderie, but like no one was willing to like help you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it felt like really yeah. isolating and it's just like no one wants to share their secrets because no one wanted to share their like success and stuff. So they would yeah. just kind of like, you know, give you a little bit, but really wouldn't give you the full gist of things. So and then I really mm-hmm. I really hate that because like our community and I think it's really come a long way now. But yeah, back then was just like really, really hard. <laughs> Really hard. really hard. You know, I follow and I really dive into like a lot of successful people. So like I'll follow people and I know this is going to be like controversial for the sex work community, but like I'll follow like Elon Musk and the stuff he did to build his business or like the Bezos or even like the Mr. Beast because he's a, a media mogul. He's running all of YouTube. So like something that Mr. Beast had said in an interview when he was on a podcast that really stood out to me is that like one of the early years of his career when he was just like making videos from his bedroom that got zero views was that he spent a year where like every day all he did was get on calls with other serious YouTubers who wanted to build their channels. And they just like made all the mistakes together and shared all the information with each other. And by doing that for a year straight, sometimes these calls were like 10, 12 hours, they sped up their learning curve because they could learn from each other and their each other's mistakes. So I really hope that in the future, this community with Sex Work CEO and like the things we're building will turn into that where it's like this closed community where we're communicating, you know, maybe behind something. So it's just, you know, there's no fans involved um, just so we can share our information and our strategies and learn so much quicker um, yeah. because we are facing things like artificial intelligence that are going to shift the way that the landscape looks and the way that we have to play with thing within that landscape. So I think it's important. And I think that the fact that I started that company when I did was very timely. And I'm really hoping that we can kind of make it into something like that because that always stood out to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and thank you so much for kind of looping this into your transition because I don't even think I even mentioned what the topic was today. But um, now, that you, <laughs> now that you're all here, we are going to be speaking about artificial intelligence today. And this is a really hot topic. Um, I've had so many people chime in and have had so many different and varying opinions on artificial intelligence, um, how that can be used for us, how that can be used against us, um, what the future of AI is looking like, what the future of sex work is looking like too, and I guess on a parallel. So we're going to be discussing all the things um, because you, my friend, are the person to be talking (laughs) to about this, (laughs) which I'm super excited to jump into. But before we kind of di- dive like with both feet into that topic, um, I know a lot of uh, listeners are really curious in terms of like your own sex work journey in terms of like how you got started. So maybe we can start there first. Sure, of course. So yeah, my uh, personal sex work journey has been, I-, I think, not wildly unique to a lot of creators that I've crossed paths with, but I was, um, it was 2011 and I was, had racked up significant credit card debt as a young woman does who grew up very poor. Um, and I needed a way to make money. And I was working at a bank, uh, not like at the branch, but in the back end, like in an office with a cubicle doing data entry and keying and all the, the routing and, and the numbers at the bottom of people's checks and um, doing that. And then on the weekends, I was go-go dancing. And I was also in college at the time. So I was going to a community college local to where I lived for business and marketing because that was what I was really drawn to in advertising. Um, 
And I was go-going and I kept noticing like on the weekends, like some of the go-go's like the, the herd was thinning, like people were quitting and I couldn't understand for yeah. the life of me why anyone would quit dancing. Cause it's just like, you know, furry boots on a box, bikini dancing, what have you. But the money to me was so good. It was like 200 bucks cash a night for Friday night and Saturday night. And to me, that was just like the most money I'd ever been able to make. So I couldn't figure out why people were quitting. And then eventually one of the cam- uh, the girls had told me, the dancers, that the girls had started webcam modeling and that's why they were quitting dancing. And I was like, well, if it's better than dancing, like, well, I want to do that. So like, again, it was kind of my first, that was my first interaction with gatekeeping because they didn't want to tell me what they were doing either. It took oh. a lot of teeth pulling. Um, and then I finally figured it out and I was introduced to uh, a website, my free cams. And the first thing I did was like, I spent probably God, like six to eight hours every day for a week just watching the top 20 models. Like I became obsessed with it. And I was like, okay, they're playing games and they're saying this and people are tipping on that and like figuring out what the token exchange rate is. And uh, for those listening, it's kind of like pesos, um, but yeah. you kind of like <laughs> figure it out. And I got very immersed in it. And it was only like a weekend. My mom actually was on vacation at the time. She came home from vacation and I told her, I was like, I want to be a webcam model. And she's like, what is it? And I sh- pulled up the campsite, showed it to her. And she's like, are you sure? Like the internet's forever. Uh, I just want you to realize what you're doing. And I was like, I am very sure because I know that I want to do like big shit. Like I've always been entrepreneurial. I always want to build business. The problem was always capital. Like I didn't have money yeah. to start. And I was always stuck on that. Like my first business, I was 11. And I was dog walking in the neighborhood and I was putting up flyers. And then my second business, I wanted to be in pageants. So like I went to every restaurant, got sponsors. Like I had no wow. shortage of sales skills, <laughs> but I didn't have capital to start anything. And I didn't know what I wanted to start. So I think that's really what draw drew me to camming. I was like, these girls are making, if I'm adding up the tokens, right? Because math's not my strong suit. They're making crazy money, these top 20 girls. Um, because I had watched them and I, I knew in that one week that I'd watched one of the top models, she made at least $20,000 based on what I was tracking. Cause I was like living on this site. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, all right, I want to do this. Cause if they can do it, like, why can't I do it? I don't see why I couldn't do the same. So anyways, I talked to my mom. She was, she was on board. She's a very supportive mom. Luckily for me, she actually helped me come up with my first cam name, which wow. was Chastity Merlot. Um, <laughs> shout out to old me, but <laughs> And not only am I bad at math, I can't spell. So I spelled Merlot wrong, M-E-R-L-O-W. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) A mistake I had to live with for like the first six years of my career. Um, But then, yeah, I dived in. I moved out of our house, uh, out of my mom's to pursue camming. I hadn't cammed yet, so I didn't know if it would work. And I used everything I had from savings from the bank job to put down my first and last on an apartment. It was like $975 rent. And so I put that down and I bought a Vizio laptop and a Cricut USB internet, you know, back in the day, which for those listening, you cannot stream on those. Like, it's ridiculous that I started my career on a Cricut hotspot or MiFi or whatever they were. Um, so I did that and moved into an empty apartment with no things. Uh, literally, I just had the box that I moved like my clothes in with and I put my laptop on that box, plugged in my Cricut internet and I logged on MFC. And uh, that first night, I remember it vividly, it was October 3rd, 2011, and uh, I told myself that I would not log off until I made my rent, no matter what it took, because I wasn't sure I could do it. Um, And it was like 4 a.m., and I had made over $1,000, and I was like, my life is different now. Like, the fact that this exists is wild. Like, why does not – why don't everyone do this? Like, this is insane. Wow. So that was it, and I never looked back. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And Okay, that was – yeah, that was like, what, 11 – ish years ago yeah oh my god yeah. what a story crazy right yeah <laughs> and great motivation too and like I mean it was really interesting to hear too like your earlier entrepreneurial ventures when you were a kid too so this has really just been like in your blood for yes. you know, so long <laughs> yes my mom and my um husband will uh, validate that I was born a salesperson. Like it's some, my husband says I'm a word wizard because anything he says to me, I can turn it back on him and sell him on a different idea. <laughs> my mom is the same. I'm like, I don't know who made you, but you have a gift. And it's like, I'm going to run with it. <laughs> That's incredible. And also like, it's really nice to hear that you got your like support from your mom right from yes. the get go. I, I think that's yes. super great. And, and, puts you in a really great position. Not all of us have that privilege to, you know, be out, be having having support from our parents or families or peers, sometimes even friends, but it's really, really great and refreshing to hear that. Yes. So that's so yes. nice. So after, after camming, where did you go from there? Because it just, did it just start to evolve into other areas and branches of sex work? 
Yeah. So well, I did camming primarily as like my main stream of income. I, I would say I like I was three years into camming or three years, sorry, three months into camming before I quit my banking job and I quit go-going because I wanted to see if I could sustain what I was doing. Um, and so beyond that, I, I was mainly focused on cam for about eight years. And then I kind of noticed like I'm very big on paying attention and being aware of like trends and things that are happening to you as a signifier of how markets are shifting. So for me, I noticed that like my regulars, you know, when you're in CAM, you have a community of people who like show up for you constantly. And then that community, even though I was fairly consistent on CAM, they were kind of dwindling away. And I was like, well, what is happening? And so I would reflect on myself. I'm like, well, where am I spending my time, money and attention? Because like that's the oil, right? Like that's the currency right now. And even back then it was. Um, and I was like, well, I'm on my phone and I'm like, I'm Facebook. And now there's this thing called Instagram and like stuff like that was like, okay, so if everyone's on their phone, how do I get on people's phones? So that seemed very obvious to me. Like I need to figure out how to get off computers and onto phones. So my first thing is like I was like going through the app store and I was looking for like live chat apps or like all these things in if they were monetizable and none of them were or they were more like a, a, like a periscope. Like you could go live, but you couldn't mm. do nudity. So right. I was like, okay. And that's – I learned that because I got banned from Periscope. Um, but anyways, <laughs> I figured that out and I was like, okay, so if I can't get on phones this way, maybe I need to look at Snapchat because Snapchat was kind of on the rise. And then I did some research, found out about premium right. Snapchat, and I was like, okay, this is where I should pivot. Um, and Lena the Plug actually had a, a lot to do with me making that decision because she's who I found and kind of – she kind of you know brought that to the forefront. So yeah. I uh, pivoted, went to premium Snapchat. Um, found some success there. And then when I went to uh, off of a different company and moved to Fancentro, that's when my premium Snapchat kind of outshined anything I had done in the industry thus far. And I really made my name. Um, And then again, I just paid attention to the trends when the trend shifted towards fan sites, which believe it or not, I had launched my own fan site back in Chastity Merlot days. um, And it (laughs) totally flopped. Like the most that site ever made me was like two grand in a month, which was great for me then. But to I did it too early when the market wasn't valuing that kind of business model. They were right. my fans weren't used to having to pay a subscription. Netflix was like new, people were kind of doing it, but like all these subscription sites were not the main thing. Mm-hmm. So I had done that too early. It failed and I had shut it down. And then when I saw premium snap shifting to the fan site kind of model, I was like, okay, now the timing is right. And then I switched to that as well. So I'm very just I'm very on the trend in terms of like Where are people spending time, money, and attention? And I just kind of try to follow that. Right. Yeah. And you do really pay quite close attention. You're very observant in terms of like, okay, what's new and up and coming? Where are people going? Where are people flocking to? Um, And that kind of, I guess, would bring us to this kind of conversation that we'll be having today in terms of like AI, artificial intelligence. There's been so much buzz. I feel like has been brewing for honestly the past like decade. Um, So it's really been interesting to watch that evolve and emerge into uh, really coming in through to the mainstream. Um, So like for myself, where I thought things were getting interesting with AI was um, finding Coconut Kitty's account like ages ago. And if you're not familiar with Coconut Kitty, I don't even know how to describe it, but like I don't know, maybe this is around like where Facetune was really popular on Snapchat and stuff. Yeah. uh, yeah, so that like basically it's – how would you describe Coconut Kitty? Just like a model with a face, like a young person. Yeah, face. I would, so she, it kind of blew up on TikTok more recently than we had seen it in the sex work community because I had been following Coconut Kitty for so long. I just thought she was this like gorgeous girl, this uh, you know talented artist, this model. Um, but then it, it had kind of unraveled, I guess not unraveled, that's probably the wrong word, but it came to light on TikTok that she was using this face app um, editor, photo editor, to kind of mm-hmm. overly edit her photos. Um, and overly edit, that's a relative term. Everyone should do what they want. But the whole idea behind it was that she was editing herself to look so young that she was trying to bait people who wanted underage women. And that was kind of the scandal around it. But if you go to her accounts now, she still does kind of the wild editing. It is, I guess, in her eyes, her interpretation of art. And she was always been an artist. So I don't know, like, intentionally behind that, if that's her truth or not. If she's saying it is, I'm assuming it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's just this kind of new era where you really can't trust what you see online because you don't know if what you're looking at is real. And I edit my photos. Like, I, I have Facetune. I use that shit. Like... You know, if you don't recognize me in person, I don't even know if I would consider that a bad thing. <laughs> like, 
I don't think it's to that extreme, but like to each their own. It's it's your it's your business, it's your content, it's your creation. So it leaves a lot to kind of discuss almost. Totally. And I think it's really interesting because I, I definitely saw it as art. Um, I think like the most problematic thing was like, yeah, the baiting part of it and just like the infantilization of it. Like that yeah. part to me made me uncomfortable because like – um, I don't know, like some of the comments that I've seen and like with the body, it just like didn't match for me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I thought it was yeah, interesting, so, you know? Yeah. The part for me was like, I, I have a history of an eating disorder. So seeing the like two inch waist, like was really triggering for me. Um, but when, if you have to, you have to tell yourself, cause you also have to take some agency over like being a, a grown person on social media and the internet where you're like, okay, well, I, I know these apps exist. I know people are doing these things. So am, is what I'm looking at real? And should I feel different or bad or impacted by it? And, and then kind of take back your agency over your experience. Because I think that there's that part of things too that we have to be aware of is like, you can also not follow. You can also not engage with this if it makes you feel a certain way. So I think it goes, there's a, a dual responsibility. There's a responsibility to try to not put that out there because you are, you should know you're affecting people, but there's also a responsibility to not consume it if it's not what you feel is good for you. So I think there's a split school of thought on that. Oh yeah. 100% agree. Like, and that's why I think, you know, sometimes like, um, say this, this kind of media is reaching, say like children and stuff that don't really have that media literacy training that aren't able to critically think yet, yeah. like that can be really problematic. And then obviously for some people that don't have those skills uh, in general, like that can be a little bit tricky. So, but yes, as you mentioned, like you have to be responsible for what kind of media you're consuming. So, I mean, on, on that front, in terms of like how I've seen this kind of evolve as well, well, in terms of like where I've been starting to pay attention was when the Lenza app got released like last yes. year. Yeah. And that was interesting too. Do you want to chat a little bit about that and your experience with the Lenza app? <laughs> yeah. So I actually, so I went to do, when I saw it, you know, it was going viral all over social. It's like, what is this? Let me look into it. But I had already been very like hands-on with these AI, especially on the graphics side for some time. So I knew right, right away what I was looking at. Um, and I went to use the app and it said I had to pay like $10 or something. And I'm very frugal. <laughs> so I was like, ah, nah, I know I can go over to mid journey on discord and do this for free. I'm good. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but seeing that and seeing the way it went viral on social was an interesting indicator of where things are at, um, in terms of like our, our social landscape. So that fascinated me. Um, it was also interesting to see that Lenza was censored. So that was a standout for me because I, although I've been using mid journey, like I'm using it for more like YouTube graphics or like things that's very mainstream facing. So I hadn't, I hadn't used it for that use case. So seeing that it was like asking for, you know, non nude images and things like that was interesting. Um, and then also seeing the way that Lenza as a company could take a free an entirely free technology package it, as this other thing and then sell it and become like a multi-million dollar company overnight yeah. when everyone could have just gone somewhere else and done it themselves. Totally. Really taught me as like a, a business person, like sometimes it's just the marketing. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's just how you repackage something, how you can sell it to people, which I've known, but that was a really great like case study of it. So I found that to be the, probably the most interesting part. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, and like, do you have any comments about like the controversial aspects of it? And for those of you who don't know what Lenza is, you can definitely check it out. But yeah, it was like super hot over the past like couple months, I would say like December, January, when it kind of exploded. But then there was also like a bit of controversy with that as well in terms of like, you know, over sexualizing, especially like women's bodies, um, like lightening dark skin, making people appear thinner and stuff, like semi-nude results for, for women's bodies and stuff as well. Any comments on that? Yeah. So I think that, um, I guess let's first speak to the, mm, let's first speak to the art kind of controversy. Cause that was a big one is like artists are being ripped off the AI learns from things that are, are pre-existing, right? So things that are posted to the internet, other people's art that they work really hard on. Um, and that is true. Like AI is going to do that just the same way chat GBT is learning off of books and novels and, in you know, medical journals and things that people have written. Um, AI can only currently learn from us. So that is just what is going to happen at the same time. Um, when it comes to changing people's bodies or lightening their skin, 
you also have to remember that AI is a reflection of what we've already done and put out in society. So it has inherent biases regardless. So like when we as a society may dub, you know, lighter skin, more beautiful, AI will do the same. So it's kind of this terrifying mirror of us as humans, which is where I think a lot of the fear comes from. Um, but at the same time, you can use these tools. I, like I tend to be optimistic. It, it's my nature. So for me, you can use these tools to do other things. I, I understand that like artists are concerned about this because they feel like it, now they're obsolete. Um, copywriters with ChatGPT, you know, they feel they're obsolete. But really, these can just be tools, in my opinion, in our tool set. They're mm -hmm. It, we didn't expect them to come for writers and artists. We thought that writers and artists would be the last people affected by AI. We thought the technical people like, you know, um, like, yeah, code writers or like kind of the lower end earning jobs. We thought it would come for their workforce first. And that's not what we're seeing, right. which is kind of just an interesting thing that we're learning along the way. But um, I think it's tool. Like you need to look at it as a tool. It's not going anywhere. Um, people look at AI like it's this new thing, but we've been dealing with algorithms the whole time. That's just an, a dumb version of AI that is completely uh, ran by human opinion in uh, motive and bias. So if anything, I think looking towards the future, AI could be a positive in that it could kind of fulfill some of the human, um, I guess, deficiencies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, hopefully in the future, there there will be like less of this inherent bias um, going forward, which, you know, still has to be probably developed. Um, but yes. I'm also optimistic, too, and hope, you know, things will change in the future as well. But, <laughs> but I mean, like, kind of turning this conversation with like a sex work lens. Um, and I know when I first tweeted about this topic, I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about. Um, I was really met with like a lot of people like, and kind of like a 50, 50 split or maybe like not 50, 50, maybe 25% scared or worried or nervous. And then the other 75% in terms of like, this is not going to be a problem. And basically my question at that time, I think the tweet was something about like, oh, do you ever think that um, artificial intelligence will replace the work of sex workers? And yes, some small percentage, well, it wasn't that small, but like 25% of people were like, oh, like, you know, I, I really do feel that this, like we can be threatened by this. Where the other, like 75% of people were like, ah, there's no problem with this at all. But I would love to hear your, your input on this. Yeah, so... Um we are the oldest profession for a reason. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know where that, like I understand fear is fear and fear is a tough thing to, to face, especially in, in light of something we don't fully understand um, and that is new to us. But we are the oldest profession. It is very hard to replicate, especially like a full service sex worker. Like that experience is so much more than a body um, which is like in AI's world, you know, these sex robots, for example. Yeah. It's so much more than that. It's an experience. Um, and AI is not sentient at the current phase and where things are at technology-wise. So like there's just – there's things that that will not be able to provide. Now, on the digital sex worker side, there's other interesting things, right? So we, we already have deep fake porn where mm -hmm. celebrities are getting turned into adult content without consent. Mm -hmm. Um and that is horrific because that, to me, should be penalized the same way like revenge porn is penalized personally. Totally. But on the same side, if I – and I've looked into this and I've priced this and I haven't gone forward but with this. But I've looked into making deep fake porn of myself so that I could have boy-girl content that I could yeah. sell because I don't make boy-girl content. Smart. So – for me, this could be a tool that gives my fans another way to consume my image in my brand that they'll never be able to get from me otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different directions things can go, but to think it makes us obsolete, I completely believe the opposite. I think in a world where AI is very involved in our day-to-day -day life and it touches nearly everything we do because it will touch nearly everything we do, there's no mistake. Um, what I would suggest is that you should look at it in the opposite light, where is if you are a human doing something, now you are a premium. If you want to chat with me on my, you know, fan site, what have you, 
um, I could charge a premium so that you know it's me versus an AI chatbot trained by me to talk like me, to respond like me, which doesn't exist yet for any fans that might be tuning in. So don't jump to conclusions. It's not there. <laughs> We're not there yet. Um, but the way I see it is like I can charge a premium to actually be myself right. while growing my business exponentially by using these tools. Um, the same goes for audio. I've been messing with um, audio AI personally to see if it can really sound like me because if it can, I could be putting out more content um, in terms of like a solo podcast for Sex Work CEO that gives and disseminates information more effectively, but it yeah. takes me half the time. So like there's so many good use cases for these things. And there's so many creators that are in a place in their business where they can't afford assistance and they can't afford like to start a podcast or to do editing and production. They can't hire editors. Where if you had AI tools that could do those things for you, think about how much more successful your business could be. So I'm, I, I err on the side of optimism because I look at these like tools and I look at myself as a human, as a premium um, that is using those tools or can't use those tools. And I would like to re kind of frame the people that listen to this if they could try to view it that way. Because I think when you're afraid of something, you're at a disadvantage. Whereas if you're embracing of something, you find all the ways that you can use it. You know, fire was scary for the first people that made fire. Yeah. They didn't know what to do with it. But once you figure out what to do with it, you're still a person. You're still kind of holding the reins. I think the fear comes from this idea that we're not holding the reins. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a very real fear. Like that's justified. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, Right now, everything's open source, which makes me optimistic. There's no corporations just completely holding this and, and calling it theirs because that would be very scary to me. Right. Um, but where things are now and where things are heading, I feel very optimistic for sure. That's such a great perspective and like all the examples that you've used there as well. Like, you know, that's – you've really like, turned it around for some people too because some people, you know – they really see that this is a disadvantage. Um, They think like, okay, like, am I going to become obsolete? Are we still going to uh, have autonomy and exist still? So I just really thought it was important to to address that question. And uh, I would love to definitely get into more specifics too in terms of marketing Mm -hmm. and sales tactics um, shortly. But um, going on to, because I was actually going to bring up the whole like deep fake porn Things that are going on, which is definitely problematic and controversial yeah. as well. Um, of course, this is this is affecting celebrities, but is have you heard of any instances where this is also affecting people in our community as well? Well, I haven't specifically heard of like a sex worker or someone who identifies as a sex worker being affected, but there was a recent huge scandal with a Twitch streamer. Um, I I heard about it on the Philip DeFranco show. I love that YouTube series, but um. They were talking about how this female Twitch streamer and many female Twitch streamers are on this deep fake porn site. And another Twitch streamer was live and had accidentally op- like showed his screen, like screen shared what oh, he was yeah. looking at. And one of the tabs was that deep fake porn site where this creator is on. And he's actually personally friends with a lot of these streamers. So that is very troubling because that is very close. I, I would consider Twitch like one step removed from live cam. Like oh, if anyone thinks different, I think you're kind of delusional like camera <laughs> girls were around a long time and we laid the groundwork for twitch streamers and live stream but <laughs> yeah. um so seeing that means it's getting closer to our space for sure um and that's a concern because again consent is still a thing and what you do with my image is not up to you it should be up to me um but that being said i think people lose focus of how much digital footprint we've already put online like you know in a future space and time, someone could, our company could, let's say Meta, right? They own Facebook. They have all of the data about the way you talk, the beliefs you hold, the values you agree with or side with, the political affiliations you subscribe to, um, thousands of pictures of you edited by yourself and posted or tagged by family and friends that you hate, um, <laughs> video content, recorded live streams. Like there is this plethora of data that could theoretically um, be uploaded and you could then almost be downloaded by people who loved you and wanted to hear your voice and who wanted to still experience things with you after you're gone. Like there's all of these questions about the data we've already given the, this space, like AI is just a computer science that is new to us, but we've been supplying algorithms and supplying social media sites with everything to do with us as, as a human, as a person for years and years and years. And we are just now gripping the privacy concerns that come with that. Mm -hmm. But when you, incorporate AI, it kind of levels that whole game up. And that is a question for me um, that I, I 
I think about deeply because it's interesting because the deep fake thing can come from that because you can, you know, take someone's social media footprint and turn them into a deep fake, yeah. you know, within maybe a few weeks, if, if that, yeah. and the cost comes down as technology improves and the time comes down as technology improves. So that's going to be a real concern, especially when you take it into like the political arena and you want to make sure the people in power are really saying and doing the things that they're saying and doing. Um, and I don't know what that, that is going to look like or how that will be handled because legislation is like years, late years behind totally. all of the tech. So always. It's concerning. <laughs> always. Yeah, always. I feel like, and another a topic too that might be concerning as well if, if some people haven't heard, but you might have, people might have heard it on my podcast before, but I am working with a master's student at my alma mater uh, that's conducting research um, on AI and a company that I found is actually re- like on my old campus. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know it was so close. She just told me about this last week when we were reviewing her research, but this research that she's conducting is all about um, using AI to scour escort ads uh, to again find keywords for human trafficking, which of course is that huge controversial topic, which we know is, has nothing to do with sex workers. But um, yeah, so like that to me was an example um, of you know how this might be used in a different way to harm sex workers and harm our well being. So I was curious to to see if you've heard anything like that at all or any other um, ways that society or government or politics have been using AI against us. I mean, you, whenever I hear just like AI and algorithm are very closely related to me. So the algorithms have been, you know, not in our favor as a community for some time Yeah. Um, because of the way, you know, <clears throat> society wants to deem nudity and nipples and like all this stuff on social, right? So they have bots and algorithms that scan for that stuff that already exists. But when it comes to like the escort ads and scanning that, that's dangerous because what data set are you training it on? What do you qualify as human trafficking? Right. What do you qualify as consensual escorting or or full service sex work? Those are my concerns is that the training set that they're using for these AIs is biased, which it will be because we are. So until we get to a a point where we've developed something that's advanced enough to remove our bias, act in our best interest, and we still have some leverage over it in the way that it moves forward without tainting it, which is a very big order and a you know tall order to fill. Um, those things are inherently going to be problematic for us. I would agree. Mm-hmm. Um, on the flip side, I think that when we're talking about technologies, so many people miss, especially with mainstream like political circles, they miss that the adult industry is, has offered up solutions to these things before, you know, there's huge DMCA companies, for example, that hash and fingerprint content from creators so that we know this is consensually made content. There's, you know, 2257s to support this. There's, um, this is from the creator themselves. They fingerprint it. All of my content is digitally fingerprinted. Um, so when you have that and you have companies in our space willingly doing that, like I believe OnlyFans fingerprints now, I know Pornhub does now that, they're supplying, hey, I can do this and tell you what belongs and doesn't. We have all of the data, yet the mainstream is um, not allowing those data sets to be brought into this equation or they're not allowing these companies to give them this resource. So that is problematic because it means they're not really trying to solve the fucking problem. Yeah. Even though we have you know, been here asking them to use what we have so that we can help solve these problems. So what I would like to see you know, in a perfect world that doesn't exist is that these tools in AI, um, I guess, yeah, tools that we bring forth are coming from people in our space, in our industry. Um, and that's something like I'm very drawn to. I don't know that I'll, I'll do that in my lifetime, but tech for me is like very important. I'm, I am in talks with two companies uh, about things in tech, not necessarily uh, AI related to this point. It's extreme, but I think that if we can get people interested in this, these technologies and interested in AI, that they might be the people that come up with these solutions and can bring them and articulate them to mainstream. And that's what I would like to see, because if we can build the solutions, there's less chance that they're going to use bad data sets and things that are going to be inherently biased that will harm us as an outcome. So 
if we can just get more people interested in this kind of, you know, future, I think that that could go a long way. I hope that I help with that for sure. Yeah. Fingers, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> we don't know what the future holds, but hopefully, yes, that's something that we can definitely work towards um, in the future. And and I'm curious to hear, hopefully some good things come out of those conversations with the company. So fingers crossed for you, Melrose. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> I'm shifting the conversation over to, yeah, more so specific marketing tactics and sales opportunities for people that want to better utilize AI to help them improve this expert game, their hustle, whatever that is that they want to do. Um, I'd love to kind of get into that. I know you've definitely used a couple examples. Um, I know I've been like paying attention to what you, you've been doing with like chat GPT and stuff to help with your SEO and just like copywriting and stuff. But anything that you'd like to share without giving away too much? <laughs> from like, oh, we can give it all away. It's free information. I don't mind. Um, the the biggest thing, like obviously copywriting, is um, I found I found with my like conversations I've had uh, with other creators, like copywriting and sales ad copywriting seems to be a big pain point for creators. Mm-hmm. Um, they over they undervalue how much the copy or the captions they attach to posts or messages or their clip sites in terms of their descriptions on their content, how much it really impacts sales. Um, so that's been something I've been really focused on and stressing with SexXEO for some time now. Um, and ChatGPT is a great tool to improve copywriting very quickly. So that was the obvious place that I went when I first found out about this tool late November. I was like, oh, this is so cool. So I can do all this copywriting super fast. Um, and I was playing with it. So one of the first like case studies I did was I went into ChatGPT which for those who aren't aware, it does censor you. So you're not going to be able to be like, make me a sexing script. It's going to be like, no, we don't do that, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but what I did was I would go into ChatGPT and I'd write something like, uh, write me a tweet that will likely go viral in a male U.S. demographic between ages of 18 and 45 um, that targets that audience. And it came back with a, a tweet that was kind of about fitness. It was something to do with like, uh, enjoy dessert without ruining your gains. It was something along those lines. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so that it's targeting like people into fitness, male demographic, that age, US based. Okay, cool. So like now that I have that information, how can I tweak this? So I tweaked the tweet it gave me from ChatGPT and I made it say, um, enjoy your dessert without ruining your gains. Uh, indulge here with my OnlyFans link. And then at the bottom, I added may cause increasingly strong forearms and then smash <laughs> that. <laughs> That tweet performed so goddamn well. It was amazing. And uh, the I had I got like 100 subs within the first few hours off that tweet. And it was better than some of the marketing content that I put out on, just on my own. Amazing. So that was my first real like case study and example where I was like, oh, this is powerful stuff. Like this is really cool. Yeah. Um, really the, the skill is understanding how to prompt it, understanding how to communicate with it effectively, understanding how to articulate what you're trying to get out of it. So I think in the future, whereas a lot of jobs will be lost and a lot of things will change, the skill of knowing how to communicate and articulate what you need from uh, an AI, that will be a highly valuable skill to have. And people will be paid lots of money to be able to do that effectively. Totally. Um, so yeah, that was my first kind of like chat GBT marketing thing that I did. And I was super impressed, super impressed. I love that. That's so smart. And also, I, I mean, it's, it's also really apparent in terms of like you really set up the parameters for it to perform well you said what kind of demographic do you want to speak to what is your target audience etc and on top of that you tweaked it which i think is also really important to kind of cater things towards yourself so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sorry i was about to sneeze (laughs) i was gonna bless you i was like waiting for it but that's, that's really smart. And that's a really, really cool example. And I just, I love how you use yourself and as like your own case studies and just to see how that works and how that is performing. So that's really, really cool. Um, for those, like, do, do you ever think that there would be a disadvantage for people that want to try to learn how to utilize this kind of platform, this app, but say... Would there, would there be people at a disadvantage that don't know how to utilize it properly or slash even like having equipment? Like, are there any barriers to this at all? Well, there's no barrier to entry currently because it's free. You know, you can create an account. <clears throat> there's still a free version, even though they did paywall uh, an upgraded version currently. 
um, but it's an open source. So everyone has access to it the same way. I've, well, everyone with internet, you know, the basic kind of, I guess there's that barrier to entry. If you don't have internet or a phone or something, yeah, then right. you're definitely at a disadvantage, but you're also already at a disadvantage without internet. Um, so beyond that threshold, it's pretty, it's a pretty fair playing field, but also nothing is fair at the same time because everyone's not going to understand certain concepts. Everyone doesn't learn the same way. Everyone has different just intelligence levels of how they grasp things. So yeah, there's inherently a disadvantage. The people that are early adopters that really figure it out, they will win. Like I, I believe that I hate to say that because it's such a, a statement, but when you, that's like saying it's like the dot com boom. You know, when the internet came into the place, the people that made money understood what to do with the internet, and the people that didn't didn't. So it is certainly a pivotal point in our human, you know, timeline for this to come out. And if you don't understand it, I really suggest you dive in and start researching, listening to podcasts, you know, googling. Um, just get on to ChatGPT and talk to it, since that's the the main one that's being discussed right now. Um, because you learn by doing, you learn by having that experience with it. The first things I searched on ChatGPT were trash. I got horrible answers. It was awful. Um, and then I started diving into, there's other resources. Like there's, um, I think it's called Futurepedia. I'm going to double check that for you real quick. But there is library. Yeah, futurepedia.io is a library that has tons and tons of uh, programs using AI that you can use, like there, it'll list different things. It's not chat GPT. It's everything and anything that they've already created that uses AI. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of go down that rabbit hole and see what exists. There's AIs that'll write you music. There's a, it's like, think of that, just that, that indication of technology alone and how we could implement it. What if you never had a copyright song again on, on the background of any of your content or on the background of any of your live streams? Like that has a huge impact for creators. So something like as simple as that is a great application, but Really, the winners are going to be the people that take the time to learn and understand it. Um, and also, again, learn to communicate with it. There's um, another great resource. I want to say it's like Prompt.io. I should check that for you, too. <laughs> Thank you. Promptbase.com. So there's another one that's called Promptbase.com, which is kind of a marketplace. And you can purchase prompts, which the prompt is kind of those parameters you set to communicate. Right. So like, I want to target this demo with this thing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you can purchase prompts from promptbase.com that will give you those communication skills to speak to the AI and get what you want out of it. And those prompts are like $1.99. It's like what we download off the app store for like a song or, you know, a new app. So really playing with those, that's going to teach you how to communicate and talk and use this tool. And your, I guess, enthusiasm for how quickly or how involved you want to be in to this learning process is going to change the course of how your future looks. I really believe that. Yeah, yeah. And it definitely shows too, because then like I always see and view you as an early adopter with pretty much any technology. I think it's super cool yeah. and very admirable as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, before we kind of jump into questions, like, can I just ask you like, where did this kind of passion and, and overall curiosity stem from? Yeah. So I think that it kind of comes back to the entrepreneurial DNA. Like there's, how do I do this thing I'm trying to do? How do I do it faster, better, with less effort, with less resistance? How do I optimize this? How do I build a system? Like these are questions in my daily life that I'm constantly asking myself. So if I make a video and I want to put it up eight places, how do I do that? Well, we went, me and a, a developer off Upwork went and built a Chrome extension. So even though I'm not using it, I'm not selling it, it's still in its early days. Technically, I could distribute content to every adult platform with a click of a button. Um, so like things like that, I'm always trying to innovate in the way I do things and streamline it and kind of chat GBT and in early, just any kind of technology, the first thing I do is like, can I use this? Is this for me? Can I put this in place? Can I tell people about this? Is this something at scale that makes sense? Um, it's just, I like to optimize and, and that's in any aspect of my life. So like <laughs> the way I line up my clothes in my closet in color order is because I know if I need something red, it's going to be in this part of my closet, like Me systems too. on systems for everything. My husband hates it. <laughs> he hates it, but I always know where his things are. So. <laughs> it's important. And like, I mean, going to what you just said there too, I'm, I'm still waiting, 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 waiting for like, a sex worker friendly version of like Hootsuite to come or to post in all the platforms. Cause like, as we all know, there's so much like back end and administrative things that we all have to do. That's just like the bane of my existence. Yes, <laughs> all of ours. All of ours. All of ours. All of ours. <laughs> 
Um, before we dive into questions, was, were there any kind of closing notes that you want to say here? I know I want to share like more tips and all that stuff too, but like you named a lot of examples there earlier and lots of great educational tools and resources. So thank you for that. But any other closing yeah. notes? <laughs> Um, I don't know if there's like closing notes like of course I'm I'm very reachable on social so if there's anything specific someone wants help with like if I have the time I'm absolutely going to get back to you I try to answer every tweet every message Um, and then on the tech side like I really hope in the future to be someone in the industry that is streamlining and helping to build out and helping to bring to market technology for sex workers that's definitely on my radar it's something I've always been drawn to it's also very fucking hard to do so so don't like look back on this podcast and be like she hasn't done it yet it's so fucking hard there's a reason people don't do it like it's hard <laughs> um but just as an example like when chat gbt came out i hired a developer again off upwork same developer actually super talented um and we built a chat gbt that would write explicit content so that creators could have sex- sexualized copy yeah um so that they could use it we built it in less than three days it worked <laughs> Um, and then I read ChatGPT's content policies and called Corey Silverstein, shout out to yeah. Corey, um, my yeah. industry lawyer. Um, and he's like, yeah, Mel, you can't do that. They can see you. And I was like, well, fuck my life. So, um, oh, based on the policies <laughs> and the way we're playing with AI, yeah, that it becomes more complex, right? It's not just up to me. It's not just up to my limitations of what I can build. It's also up to policy and, and the way things are set up in terms of the company, open AI and things like that. Um, but also at the same time, we don't have to use open AI. There are other AI technologies. It's not just one. Um, so do I think one in the future will be sex work friendly? Yeah. I'm very confident people are developing that as we speak. Um, and I think that there's really cool tools coming down the pipeline for creators. Like I had hinted that I spoke with someone at Expos LA this past, um, what was it? month, month ago or so, um, about, uh, just a traffic, like traffic is a major problem we need to solve for adult creators, mm-hmm. especially creators with smaller socials. And there's solutions that are only months away that I think will shift the way that we do business. And I'm super excited by that and confident by that. And I think also like I'm privileged to know what the inside track of some of the shit looks like, right? Like people don't know that these things are coming. So it's easy to be afraid and it's easy to be like concerned. Um, but I think that with what's coming and with where things are heading, if you can put the fear aside because it's happening anyway, I hate to say that, like you're either on board or you're behind, like it's going to happen. Um, it's just embracing it and learning how to use it just like anything else. Yeah. So Totally. And it's already here. So <laughs> it's <laughs> probably huge. like it a good time to just pay attention at this point. So yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We- We've got a ton of questions and also shout out to Corey as well. If you are interested in hearing that episode, that was episode 156 where I had him on. <laughs> nice, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, Melrose, there's a bunch of questions that came in from the audience that we should probably get into. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, there's so many. And we'll try okay. our best to answer all of them. I don't even know any of these answers at all. So we'll just kind of go through it all. But um. Yeah, I guess the first one is, how do people for AI testing or development get picked and by who? I think that that is a broad question. So each company, most of these companies are like privately owned. So there's no way of knowing that. Um, in in terms of who AI is tested on, it's tested on all of us. Uh, that the reason ChatGPT is free is because it wanted us all to go in there and fuck with it. So it can learn how we think and what we say and what we do and what we're curious about. Um, and at the same time, it's the same thing that social media did with algorithms. It was learning based off us, our behavior, the way we interact, the things that keep us engaged, keep us clicking, keep us on the app, um, what our triggers are as humans. Chat GPT and AI, that specific AI by open source, that it's learning the same way. It's trained on us and on I, that one as a language model. So it's trained on written language uh, that exists out there in the, in the interwebs. Um, but we are always the guinea pig. If you are ever using something for free, that means you are the product. You are what is being used. Um, so keep that in mind when you download an app or when you sign up for a new social. But um, yeah, we are we are the guinea pig. We are what is training AI at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what company uh, it is. It's just us. 100%. <laughs> um, this person writes in, have the people doing AI testing on others experienced it themselves? Um, 
That's a unique question. Uh, have the people doing AI testing experience with that? I think like we are all, again, we're all the guinea pigs. So you can't like avoid something when it's out there in the ether. Mm-hmm. Um, even if they, if, if they don't ever log into something like ChatGPT and ask it a question, uh, they're still inadvertently a part of the ecosystem of what it's trained off of. It's trained off of all available internet data or all of av- available data in a training set, whatever that training set may look like, whoever is providing it. Um, it's the reason like Google will have a different outcome with their AI um, when it gets released because they have such a different training set because they have so much data on us versus the way a meta uh, AI might respond because it has a different set of training data on us. It's more emotional, the way we engage with each other as a community versus Google is probably more, I mean, a little bit of that, right? Because of YouTube, but more what we Google and what we're curious about and what we're asking about and diving down rabbit holes for. Um, So they may all look different, um, but I don't think you can avoid being a part of what it's trained on. Like if you exist with an internet connection, you're involved. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Definitely. Gosh, do you have an answer for everything? This is just fascinating. I, I hope they're right. I'm not an expert. I'm just an enthusiast, guys. <laughs> I love it. You know what? You're you're more enthused than I am. And like, because I, I saw these questions come in and I'm just like, I don't even know if she can answer these, but so far, it's so good. <laughs> My live cam experience has made me very uh, good at improv. So. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this next question is, uh, will people planting ideas in AI subjects be tested to validate the origin of their ideas? So repeat that one again to me. Yeah. Um, will people planting ideas in AI subjects be tested to validate the origin of their ideas? Well, right now, no one's like, there's no the bias and stuff that's planted is is a, a product of us as people. So whatever is showing up, that's that's on us as humans. Um, but the problem with this idea of planting things into AIs, that's a real concern for sure. You know, you have governments that will eventually create and release their version of AI with their propaganda baked in. Yeah. That's a concern. Um, certainly, but I think that's, that is the fear talking a lot of the time, whereas open AIs like from open source or open AIs, like what they've created are open source. So they are more, I guess, democratized than the way. A government would approach AI. So, but these are the same inherent problems we face with the internet. There's censorship in countries already. So it's going to be a little, I would expect more of the same um, in the way that things things develop. You know, bad actors will be bad people. There's more good people out there than bad people. Um, And the way we regulate this is to be, to be determined. You also have to think just on the creative side, since all, you know, digital creators are still creators, like who owns the copyright on stuff will be an interesting question. Like I wrote um, an entire ebook. I'm going to put out at some point here for Sexwork CEO. I'm going through and rewriting it in, in the way I see things and correcting some of the information because it can't speak too explicit. <laughs> um, but having AI write, write the first draft of that book and then me going in and actually tweaking it to make sense for our space and, and giving it those missing pieces. Who wrote that book? Did AI write that book? Did I write that book? Who holds the copyright? Um, these are questions that will be interesting to see unfold. Who, if you make a digital graphic using Midjourney, do you own that copyright or does Midjourney? Um, these are things that will be yet to be seen. And again, there's got to be some kind of ethical um, code or ethical licensing process that comes out as a part of this. But that's it's a ways down the road. So yeah. it'll just kind of be interesting to see how things unfold. Hopefully, in uh, you know, for the better. Um, and I just, I have faith in that. There's more good people than that. So it's going to go well. Totally. My and it's really great that you're asking these questions though, too, because yeah, these are things that are going to be coming up in the future and will have to be addressed at some point for sure. Um, this person wrote in, has everyone involved in AI programming been checked for mental stability? Oh, I mean, there's no way of knowing that. No idea. Uh, these com- companies are massive. They're, they're made of lots of people. No one knows really who's on the inside. Um, but Again, it's training off of all of us. So, you know, how much of the population has mental illness would be a better question, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think one person is going to shift the the way this operates. It's also learning off of itself. It's learning off of the real landscape, not just this one singular person's opinions. So I, I don't think that would be so much a fear. 
versus like I would say like the bigger question, how much of the population is dealing with mental illness and still out there online searching things and Googling things and yeah. <laughs> talking to chat DVD. Um, that would be a better question, I think. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> um, what is the end goal for AI? It will never end if they seek something specific. The only way AI testing ends is death or the controller is being satisfied. And being satisfied means they need to stop it before it's too late. What's your take on that? Um, uh, so I think like Elon had a famous interview where he was like very intentional with the way he spoke about AI, how he's like, you know, developing the Tesla bots and Neuralink, uh, two technologies to make humans more compatible with AI, which I think is a great thing. Um, mm-hmm. even if you're not an Elon fan, if, if he's the only one doing it, like, thank you. Like someone should, um, <laughs> but the, this idea that it's going to be the end of civilization, I think that is, you can go so deep on that. Do you even think that this, that what we're living now is not a simulation because the odds mathematically are against that. Mm -hmm. So ending civilization, maybe there is no civilization. We don't know. Uh, So you could go real down the rabbit hole if you wanted. Also, there's a lot of other things threatening humanity way more time sensitive than AI is. AI will learn quickly. It'll develop rapidly, exponentially. That is true. Um, but we can set parameters for things. And I think people seem to forget that. Um, but like, if you're worried about doom and gloom and humanity ending, like climate change, um, the poles on earth could shift. There's like a lot of data that suggests that the poles on earth are shifting and will flip 90 degrees and cause a catastrophe, uh, like a cataclysm event. So that is almost more likely to beat AI. There's like a lot of scary things in the world if you really want to start going that direction. So while AI could be scary, um, we don't really have a say in this. So it's almost like a the universe, we're in this space, right? People can only affect really their local community, what they do, how they treat others. Um, and you can't stop AI. Totally. Just like you couldn't stop the internet. You can't, you know, you can only make a dent in the things you can make a dent in. So you could just live in fear and, and do that. Or you could just, Utilize this as a tool while you can before something major does happen. You know, we've been a, a superpower for a long time. Those tend to come to an end. So that's my outlook on it. Is, uh, we got bigger problems, to be honest. We, yeah, we got bigger fish to fry. And like, I just, yeah. I, I, we got like a lot of questions too. And not just for this episode, but just fear mongering questions in general, uh, which I always think is important to address on the show. Um, not everything is doom and gloom <laughs> and yeah. you just need to broaden your perspective a bit as well. So totally. have an open mind. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Just a couple more questions here. And I guess this one's a kind of funny one. I know we asked these questions earlier, but if you could shoot with any male talent, who would it be? And why did the flush mechanic? <laughs> I love that. So I have this adorable, awesome friend, the flush mechanic, um, look him up on social. He just gave himself a shout out. Like, look at the marketing genius behind this man. I am so impressed. <laughs> um, and I don't shoot with male talent, but I, I would shoot with a lot of my friends if I did. Um, I'm very blessed to be surrounded by talented, stunning, amazing, incredible humans. That's this, that's what makes up this entire space. So if I shot with any male talent, I would probably be shooting with all male talent. Sorry, flesh mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be everyone. It wouldn't be one. <laughs> Can't just pick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Melrose, we got the last question here. Um, how about security and privacy when it comes to using AI services? How is our data being used and how can we be part of the process without being exploited? Big question. Questions. That is a, yeah, that's a big question. Security and privacy. I mean, that is going to fundamentally go back to algorithms and social media. We've already given away all of our privacy in a very real way. The, the way we have cell phones in our pockets that m- can monitor every move, the way someone can show up, you know, U.S. government officials can show up to a protest with Stingray applications in, in white unmarked vans and get everything off your phone without any sort of consent or search warrant. Um, these are real things that exist that are privacy concerns in our present day, and they're happening already. So... While privacy, I'm sure, is a concern with using AI, you've already put an Alexa in your home. You are already using Siri. You already have these devices planted in your regular life. So I feel like it's a little late for that question. Um, 
these things are also designed to make the way we live and, and move through the world easier. And humans, by nature, really prioritize convenience. So if you don't want, if you do want these conveniences, you are trading your privacy. And that is all the time, constantly with every, everything you do, you know, um, the fact that there's, I'm a big car enthusiast for those who don't know me, but there's, you know, a make of an Audi car that can tell you if you drive at this speed limit, you won't hit a single red light. That technology exists. That's so, so cool. yeah, so cool. So like if I value that con- level of convenience, that's great. But I also know that that, that car is, has some kind of internet connection at the base level fundamentally forever without me having any say when it's on or off. Mm-hmm. And also what that comes with is that someone with an internet connection can have access to my car just on like first principle basis. Right. It can, it's possible. It's entirely possible. So you have to ask yourself whenever you're trading um, convenience – for you're doing it for privacy um, and you have to determine how you value that. If you value privacy, you should probably have a brick phone from the nineties yeah. and stay offline. Like there's no roundabout way to say it. Like that's the reality. Um, how is our data being used? We have no idea. We, we don't have an idea now just based off social media. We sort of have an idea um, in terms of like, if I wanted to run a Facebook ad, I could target it so narrowly that I could almost, choose to target a population of people that are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, about to go manic and impulse buy. Like you can target that selectively using something like Facebook ads because of the data that they have off of us. So when you're talking about how your data is being used in any way you can theoretically imagine it's being used. Um, And we, we agree to that when we check the terms of service box. So again, if you don't want to be part of that, even though it will happen with or without you, you're one human in, in, you know, what are the 8 billion now that are participating in this, whether they agree to it consciously or not, um, your data is not going to skew it much one way or the other just by opting out. Um, So it's going to happen regardless. And then what part of this process uh, without being, how can we be part of this process without being exploited? That that is like um, an existential moral question. And for that, I don't know that you can be a part of any process with being without being exploited. I don't know that, you know, ex- exploitation is kind of something that lands on a spectrum in my brain. So like, y- you know, you have the convenience of like a, a good example again is like that Alexa. But if you ask Alexa to delete all the past recordings it has of you, it'll read back to you. I'm deleting so X number of recordings. So you, you don't, I don't think you get both. I think you, you trade. Um, and you have to just kind of think personally for you, it, is your life and the way you want to live and move and operate and navigate the world worth the convenience of that trade? And if it's not, you can do things to, to safeguard it. You can have a home that's internet free. There's people that are very sensitive um, to internet and Wi-Fi and the way it affects their bodies um, from what I understand. So there's people that are, you know, living almost like a Faraday cage situation so that they're not getting uh, hit with these kind of wavelengths and stuff. So right. if you want to go to that extreme, you totally can. Whatever's right for you, I think you should do. Um, but ultimately, like, it's here. It's everywhere. I don't think I don't think you should fear it. You should just embrace it and learn how to navigate using it. Because if you don't, you, you will be left behind. Like, that's the other outcome. Um, so you have to make that choice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a really great point to kind of end on and wrap up our conversation um, is to, yeah, go ahead and embrace it, see what the future holds, or you can go choose to live off the grid, which is also like a different kind yeah. of life. And, and, that's, yeah, really and cool. that's, that's beautiful too. Yeah. Like, oh my God, to go camping and not have service is a fucking dream. It like, is. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, please. So I get it. It's whatever's right for you, for sure. Exactly. But Melrose, before I let you go, where can we find you? Yeah. So you can find um, all of my personal socials are at Melrose Michaels. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Um, it's youtube.com forward slash Melrose Michaels Sins, S-I-N-S, uh, for Shameless in the South series. And then um, at Sexwork CEO on Twitter and Instagram, uh, forward slash SW CEO on YouTube and TikTok. And uh, that's kind of where everything lives. We're very social media forward. Most of our information is on social. 
We're working on developing um, an app for Sex Work CEO. I hope that we can get it through the App Store just so we can have a community in one place where it's only creators and we can openly discuss, you know, the things that help us learn, make us better and kind of bring that future to us and curve that learning curve. So I'm hopeful that we can get that done. Um, that's my kind of new project right now. And then also Sex Work CEO is really active in gathering data about the sex work community and data that's consensually given to us via surveys mm -hmm. so that we can kind of monitor things like, um, you know, banking discrimination, how many people in our industry have been deplatformed on Instagram, things like that, that are immeasurables for, you know, an OnlyFans or like a, a content platform to measure. Right. Um, because when we go to Congress and we have these co really important conversations about how banking discrimination affects our community or how we should decriminalize sex work, we don't have data to show them why this matters and they need data to see it and to make data-driven decisions. So if you are listening to this and you are a digital creator or a content creator um, in the sex work realm, please consider taking our surveys because they will at some point and on some level absolutely impact and change the shape of the landscape where we operate. So please consider doing that because again it's all consensual we're not stealing data from platforms we're asking for it yes. um and uh it's just it's just me in this company um and you know uh, other people that help me that i very tr very much trust other sex workers other industry people um who are making intelligent intentional decisions with with how we use this data so mm. if you're open please take our surveys that would be the best way to help further what we do here at sex work ceo Yes, and they I've, I have taken those surveys and they don't take much time at all. So please check it out. Please, please, please. Go give her a follow. Like, check out all the websites, all the things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for questions. And, like, everything you put out there is is really informational and just super knowledgeable. So thank you for all the work that you do. Um, <laughs> for everyone else listening at home, it is stripped by Sia on all podcast platforms. You can go ahead and rate five stars. You can go ahead and nice, like write a nice little review for us as well. Um, that really helps with visibility and people uh, helping find the show and have access to it. So that's one way you can help out. Of course, as I mentioned earlier in the show, you can also financially help out with uh, Patreon, which is patreon.com slash stripped by Sia. And if you have any feedback, comments, questions, uh, you can reach me at uh, stripped by Sia on Twitter, as well as on Instagram or um, stripped by Sia.com. I would be happy to chat with you, whether it's good or bad, um, any kind of feedback. If you want to bring me to bring people on the show, if you want to be in the show, just go re reach out <laughs> that way. Love that. Thank you so much, Alrose, for joining me on the show this week. It's going to be another great episode next Sunday, every single Sunday, dropping at midnight, Pacific Standard Time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You're listening to Stripped by Sia, hosted, produced, and edited by Steph Sia, music by Ted D. Graphic design by Maria Bellandarama and photography by Ian Gabrin.